chart. Never done whole parts. Oh, they take little tiny pieces. There won't even be a scar. I think I found the problem. Oh, come on, you're the doctor. Everyone, lights out and quiet. Hello, and welcome back to the Columbia University Film Festival interview series here on The Medium Work. We begin this entry with two filmmakers discussing two films. In one, a seemingly innocuous game of backgammon becomes a tense battleground for unspoken relationship issues. In the other, a woman reveals to her daughter a series of decades-old love letters sent to her by a former professor. Without further ado, here's Wes to take us in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Media Morgue, where movies come to be examined. This will be another one of our Columbia Film Festival 2023 interviews. Uh, I am your host, Wes. I'm Justin. I'm Danny. I'm Zach. And today we have two guests to talk about two movies. Uh, Would our guests introduce themselves in the movies? Yeah, um, I'm Hazel McKibben. I'm the writer and director of She Always Wins and the director of Like Mother. And I'm Nina Cochran. I am the producer of Like Mother. Amazing. And, and could you guys just tell us a little bit about your films before we even start with the questions? Um, she Always Wins is about a couple with a large age gap. Um, and she brings him back to the UK to meet her family for the first time and teaches him how to play backgammon. And over the course of the game, their power dynamics shift. And... Um, mm-hmm. When he realizes that she let him win, um, the relationship is kind of done. It's about power um, and making yourself small in a relationship. Like Mother is a documentary film um, that we worked on together that Hazel directed. Um, It's a story in which Hazel talks to her mother on camera, um, in which her mother is revisiting love letters sent to her as a teenager by one of her teachers. Um, And the, the film really focuses on the difference between the way her Mother remembers a relationship and then the reality that the sort of physical evidence of these letters suggests and, and sort of looking in the patterns of generational trauma um, through the scope of the film. Cool. That immediately uh, kind of presents a question for me. Um, and it, it also helps to clarify why these two were submitted together, because it mm-hmm. seems that they both are kind of. Uh, looking at power dynamics in relationships, one of the things that immediately stood out to me, and she always wins, um, and I know you know Zach brought this up too, uh, is how it captures the weird kind of miscommunication that can occur between uh, uh, within a couple. Um, these sort of like when there's something just under the surface that's unresolved, but you have not decided to address it yet. So there's kind of these passive aggressive things and something that would usually be taken as a joke is now like misunderstood to be serious. And, you know, a place that I'm sure a lot of us have been even outside of romantic relationships. Um, I'm curious to know Hazel with, because that's the one you also wrote, right? Um, How did you approach the writing of that in terms of, you know, uh, how literal, how word perfect were the actors or was there room for interpretation there? Yeah. Um, Well, it's based on my own experience of a relationship and also my relationship with my sister. I'm definitely borrowing from my own life pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. Um, And though it was scripted, um, the lead actor, Honor, had never done anything scripted before, only improvised. Um, So we worked a lot in rehearsals to, to have a script, to have the words, but to have the words feel like her own. So she took she took the script and adapted it. Um, all the actors did, which is how I generally like to work of like, you know, there's like a, an intention behind all of it, but you want it to feel natural and like it belongs to them. Um, so by the time we shot, we were pretty perfect, but there was some work in rehearsal to, you know, make it feel human, I guess. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, I know that uh, Pablo Lorraine works like that too. We've we've talked about a couple of his films. One of Dan's favorites yeah. uh, on this show, and dude. he'll he'll introduce a scenario, um, and there'll be some idea of here's each of your characters' objectives. Now get there. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Um, and it's something that you can only do, I think, or that you can feel fully comfortable doing when you are fully comfortable with your performers. Um, Zach, I'll, I'll throw it to you. I know that you uh, enjoyed the performances in. Uh, she always wins particularly. Yeah. Um, I thought the actors were fantastic and I thought they really captured, um, 
just that tension super well. You know what I mean? Like just everything feels so loaded and there's just like, you know, just like a lot of signals that are being like missed or interpreted in uh, the wrong way. And I just, I thought that was all really captivating and you kind of answered it, but um, yeah, I was curious if you could give us a little insight into what that process was like um, in terms of their improvisation and how they adapted the script. Like if it, if like, you know, they did that together or that was kind of something they did like separately in a kind of like script analysis and then brought together like the next time they rehearsed. Yeah. I mean, the, the triangle dynamic of the whole thing was really important to me. Like it's, it's what you, what each of the three of them sees when they're together or not together or how the relationships change um, based on who can hear them and um, who's a part of the conversation. So we worked in rehearsals together and also individually and then like in twos and to, to really work out like how, how the intention changed based on who else was in the room um, and figuring out the subtext. I mean, the film is like so much of it is just under the surface um, and yeah, like rehearsed it a bunch, but also um, changing the objectives and even being on set, like we were still working through things and figuring out like tone and the words didn't change, but um, you know, the intention does. And I ended up with, we were shooting on film, so not hundreds of performances, but um, I had options and range of like how, how the dynamics worked. And then in the edit figured out the most bubbling tension mm -hmm. under the surface, I guess. That's great. Yeah. I, uh, I've never played backgammon. <laughs> ever uh, that was one of my I, mom's I, favorite we actually games we actually up. bought one we actually bought a whole backgammon set once we watched the movie yeah. oh uh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's right off a game <laughs> it's my really fun tried to teach me, <laughs> they always tried to teach me to play it but i could never get the the gist of it um it always yeah, seemed like I a very know. sophisticated kind of board game you know mm -hmm. like a, it's like, like a more sophisticated substitute for checkers or something I feel like it's easy and it's also hard. Like, and that's why it's kind of perfect for the film because it's, um, it's in theory, like, you know, easy to, to win, except it's completely not like it should, it's a bit of luck. Um, none of the actors knew how to play. So all our BTS is like me teaching them behind the scenes, like how to, <laughs> how to do it. Hazel, how good are you at backgammon in real life? Um, I'm good, but I'd say my sister's better. <laughs> Okay. Okay. She's the real, the this, queen of the family, <laughs> and she always wins, really, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who always good. wins? This does raise another question for me, though. When you 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 mentioned briefly that you pulled a lot from your own life um, in order to create this, well, this could just be a matter of what you're comfortable with. Was there ever a point where you considered actually stepping in as the lead, or is or you firmly a, a writer director, mm -hmm. not an actress? I think it would be a very bad film if I was the lead. Um, no, it's, it's, I'm much more comfortable behind the camera. Um, and yeah, it. I mean, even in, in like mother, um, you hear my voice, but I never intended and never would really, would really want um, to be on camera. So I think I can like do a good job with an actor to, um, you know, explain all the tensions that go into something and like how I felt and hopefully um, the film, um, gives a window into, into feelings that, that were mine, but also I think are kind of universal um, through a much better performance mm -hmm. than I could ever deliver. <laughs> Fair enough. I, 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 just to peel back the curtain for a second, Hazel, uh, it, was a, it was a big talk at, at, at Columbia and the years below you that you had been shooting on film um, because all of us were like, we want to shoot on film, but it's just not realistic. Uh, but but the look the look that you found with film, with, with your film stock was, was really great. And it's this kind of like... Um, almost like tender bluish look that you got out of yeah. the film. Um, and I was wondering uh, if you had any visual references going in that you were like, okay, I want the film to kind of feel like this. Yeah, I did. Um, I had a lot of like uh, Romare references um, and mm. summer and like hot and warm. And then we showed up in Wales and it rained for the entire time. Um, mm. <laughs> so I tried mm. to adapt my idea of like, summer and like again like that to me lends itself to sort of a bubbling tension um and mm -hmm. using film i wanted 
we chose 35 specifically um, mm-hmm. because I wanted it to be like a p- picture perfect world. And then all the darkness mm-hmm. is underneath um, shooting on, we wouldn't have shot on 16. It would have been, it was 35 if we could afford it, which in the end we could or digital because I just wanted it to look like perfect in a way um, to really have the tension subvert it. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, so all my references were much warmer <laughs> um, and more like South of France hot than it ended up being. Um, but I think it's like perfectly suited to Wales and where we yeah. shot in the UK for it to be this like green kind of blue look. And yeah. I'm glad we shot on film in the end. Yeah, it really works. I, I think the color palette is, is one, the thing that I really do remember about the movie is, Thank you. is the relationship is kind of icy and the film kind of feels a little chilly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I think, I think those two things, and then she takes that dive in the water and it's just like an ocean of blue. So I, I think yeah, yeah. the use of color in that movie really, really works. Um, yeah. It provides a great texture too. It really complements the, uh, I've never been to the UK. So as an American, my point of reference is like a weekend in East Hampton, you know, it kind of complements the texture of that. You can't beat, can't beat film. Yeah. Yeah. You can't beat it. I, uh, yeah. um, it, it's a question that keeps entering and then quickly leaving my head. Give me a second. Um, oh, I can say that when I was watching the film, I was definitely because of that tension and that like undercurrent, I was anticipating, I think my mind goes crazy places. I think, cause I watch a lot of psychological thrillers. I didn't know if there was going to be like some, like crazy ending where like they kill the guy or something and they throw his body in the water because he beat her at backgammon. But you know, I mean, that's like, the ultimate. It, well, right? it's a little but, suggestive, isn't it? That final shot, like who knows where we could go from here, how her head yeah, is just I, kind I, of bobbing above the water. It reminds me of like a uh, right. wild things. Have you ever seen that with Nev Campbell? All right. Well, never mind. Lost. <laughs> neither, neither here nor there. No, forget but, it. But to your point, I, I guess I'm just curious when you, when you make a film like this, that is so open-ended, that is, kind of um lean are you anticipating that people will kind of project onto it are you hoping for that are you are you saying everything that you need to know is within the film and that's it like there's nothing more to wonder about it i think um it is definitely a bit up to interpretation i mean the main thing i wanted was for the whole film pretty much nobody's on the same page um And they're all talking at cross purposes and having different understandings of what's going on. And by the end, they're all clear. Like we know that she's let him win. The sister knows he knows, and she knows that they both know. Um, And what that means for their relationship, I think is up for interpretation. I mean, yeah. Kind of opaque. Yeah. It's, and also I think specific, like for my personal experience, um, the relationship was not over in this moment of, um, sort of like betrayal, but maybe it should have been. Um, and I didn't want it. I didn't want to be too clear because it's not necessarily clear to me. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that's more true um, and maybe a little more honest and also more relatable because it's, you know, every it's, it's, it's personal, I guess. And this, this mm-hmm. power, the power dynamics are always personal and um, yeah. So yeah. Open-ended. Yeah. Well, they say that uh, film school is cheaper than therapy. So if you can just... Do they say that? I I feel like when you walk to Columbia, that's actually written on the doors. (laughs) (laughs) You walk into Dodge Hall and you're like, yep, this is the place for me. (laughs) (laughs) To uh, express, um, you know, uh, something that you feel might have been unsaid or uh, that you would have done differently through narrative, then that's great. But I I think it it pivots pivots us quite nicely into... Like mother. Uh, like mother. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I just want to ask you, Nina, specifically as the producer, um, you know, what drew you to attach yourself to the film? And also, is it, I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I don't go to Columbia. Wes is the only one here who does. <laughs> is it, um, is submitting documentary to cuff a different process than submitting narrative film or how does, how does that work? Cause I think you guys are the first doc in the history of cuff. Is that true? Like, I think you guys are the Congratulations. Nice. I mean, Trailblazing. <laughs> certainly, certainly in the last five to ten years, I think you're the first doc. Wow. Yeah. 
I thought you were just going to say the first one you've interviewed in this series. <laughs> no, so, no, so, no, no, uh, no. It sounds like that and. Um, <laughs> yeah, so just to answer that easy question is there's no different process for mm -hmm. submitting to Cuff. Um, it's sort of the same. We did have to get it approved. Um Mm. before we went into production for it to be a Columbia mm. short because it, you know, the sort of the default is to go narrative fiction rather than sure. documentary mm -hmm. though the, the, the project actually started out was supposed to be a hybrid. So we always knew this was the idea. And still could and this be. Is how I got it. And still could be. Uh, um, mm. But so Hazel came to me um, saying, I, you know, this summer, actually apparently while she was location scouting for she always wins, her mother, while they were driving through Wales, started to tell her this story about this teacher. Mm -hmm. And Hazel had never heard this story before. And her mother said, I have these letters. I haven't looked at them in decades. So that already felt fascinating and amazing. So then I, I saw Hazel in the fall at Columbia. Um, we knew each other beforehand. And she said, I want to do something about this. I'm not sure what, but I know I want to have my mom looking at the letters for the first time on camera. And then maybe we'll turn it into a fictional piece from there. And it will be perhaps like a hybrid of um, fictionalizing her memories before the letters are looked mm. at. And then perhaps fictionalizing them again as her memories change when she's looked at the letters. So all of this sounded fascinating to me as a producer. I mean, what, what a dream to have someone, <laughs> someone like able to come to you with this kind of like open-endedness. And it's really organic storytelling in that way where – we know there's something there or we're trusting that there's something there and we're letting it sort of unfold in front of us. Um, and then the reason that at least as of now, it's just a documentary is because the story we, we both feel is really told simply in her mother's sort of telling of the story and then mm -hmm. looking at the letters on camera and then really being honest and incredibly articulate about how it feels after having seen the letters and how her memories feel so different. Um, so it, I, it feels like we had accomplished that. I mean, it still may change. Um, yeah. But yeah. I so, think it, um, yeah, go ahead. it, I had no idea what my mom was going to be like, <laughs> like I didn't, she could have been <laughs> like, it was sort of the, the filming of the short was kind of a research to see what it was. And um, to see then if we developed it into a longer narrative hybrid thing um but once I, I started cutting it together and we were looking at it um it you know it felt like a standalone of a sort um I, there's definitely a larger there's so much footage and a larger story but for now we have our our, our little doc short <laughs> yeah exactly so what was that like uh working with your mom in that way and like hearing like that that story like in terms of directing her like what was that process like for you guys um it was interesting I mean I really had no idea what to expect I'm used to narrative I this is my first experience with documentary and you know there's like so much more control you have over narrative stuff but um I had kind I kind of felt like this was a thematically interesting to me and related to my other work, but also a moment where I could experiment a bit. Um, she always wins was like my main thesis film and it was mm -hmm. done and finished and like out in the world. Mm -hmm. So Nina and I um, just talked about it and we're like, you know, we can be a little free and like, see what it is. And if it's nothing like whatever, no, like no harm, no foul. Like it was mm -hmm. inexpensive to make and just one day of filming. Um, so going into it, I kind of had zero expectations. Um, and then was pleasantly surprised both in the filming of it um, and and how my mom was on camera. I mean, I know I would be like bad, which is, I don't know, I guess why I expected her to be bad, but she was very good. So um, it, it's, yeah, that's that. She's a natural. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things with documentaries too, where you don't really want to, like we didn't want to prepare Hazel's mom mm -hmm. too much because the whole point is the fresh organic right. experience. So, you know, you hope she doesn't wake up with a cold that day sort yeah. of thing. Right. Um, it, it is interesting to, to hear you to talk about uh, the sort of nebulous space that it was pitched in, in terms of like whether it would be narrative or, or documentary, because while watching, I, I was wondering really up until the end, if it was documentary or if there was a, a created mm -hmm. story or some kind of blend of both. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would ask, you know, are there 
uh, longer, larger plans for either end or both of these films? Would you expand them? I mean, I could see, you know, there's a way that like mother could be turned into an entire documentary it really could, interviewing yeah. different people's moms yeah. about different experiences, yeah, not to like, sell you guys yeah. <laughs> it, it, it would be like your version of the souvenir not to sell you guys on it but what do you think there, you know, in premiere. <laughs> we can always put our logo on yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe a little producer <laughs> credit <laughs> I, I think it's like um well the reference really was like the tale or stories we tell that was like what we thought going in mm. um and there's a world i mean i guess we'll see like it's kind of, this is, Cuff is going to be the first screening of, of the film. So we're sort of just starting the festival life of it. And I'm working on feature, narrative feature projects. Um, so kind of just seeing what happens with it. It's, um, it's the beginning of its life, I guess. So mm-hmm. I think I would love to do something longer um, and, and, and hybrid. Um, I had always thought, because I don't, I'd never mm-hmm. thought of myself as a documentarian or a documentary filmmaker um but i don't know it's kind of that's like the fun thing about shorts is like they take on a life of their Mm -hmm. own and um you never know how they're going to kind of snowball and certainly for she always wins um that's been a process as well as like after its festival life figuring out what the longer form looks like would you speaking of oh the, no, you go, oh, sorry, Zach. No, 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 please. I was just going to say, speaking of the the future of 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 you know your career and and past festival life, I'm I've never asked this to any of the filmmakers. I'm only asking because Justin's here. But is there is there a um, is there an actor that you've worked with um, on either Double Speak or She Always Wins or any of the other things you've done that you're like, that's my person. Like I'll write roles for that person. Like I really enjoy working with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely both Honor and Angela. Um, Angela from Double Speak and um, Honor and She Always Wins. I, I Angela, I've worked with again since Double Speak was a couple years ago. So I've had opportunities to work with her on other projects, like commercial projects, um, and would love mm-hmm. to work with her on something narrative and yes for honor um there's a feature that i'm working on that um i very much see her as the lead but what um you know we'll see so hard so so many steps to getting anything near even casting um who knows (laughs) yeah just just a lot of people reading your script and being like "Mm -mm, we don't want it yeah (laughs) you're just like i guess well this is just my soul that i gave you but that's fine um (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, well, I was just in terms of possibly developing Like Mother further, would you ever consider since you, you know, you saw your mom and how natural she was, would you consider inserting yourself and like taking that leap uh, and maybe placing yourself in there, maybe just showing yourself on camera? I doubt it. Ah. <laughs> I really doubt it. I really, really doubt it. Um, so it's, close. It's, it's, it's not my forte. I'm you want to keep your audience at arm's That's length, fair. right? Yeah, I, I just think it's there. There are people who are way better actors than I ever could be. So, <laughs> you know, right. Hazel, it's in in an era where uh, multi hyphenateism is very popular. It's we do. I do respect someone who's like, this is what right. I do. Yeah, I'm Park Chan Wook, who's just like, I'm not coming <laughs> right, on. Right. I'm not coming <laughs> on. Um, yeah. we have a, 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 a signature uh, sign off question to ask you both. It is a bit of a pop. Oh quiz uh but it's a fun one the medium org is a double feature podcast you brought us two movies uh usually what we do on our regular episodes is review a current film and an older or more obscure film back to back so uh if you were playing she always wins and like mother uh at a festival and you could program pairs for them what would they be yeah Ooh, that's interesting i don't know Nina, what do you think? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, my mind is worrying so fast. Um, I mean, it's hard not to want to say, I mean, we've mentioned it, but for like mother, at least, um, I would say stories we tell. Cool. Um, yeah. That was such an important reference when we were going into it. And that is also a, a project that Sarah Polly really entered, I think not quite sure how it was going to open up and pan mm. out. And um, yeah, so I, I just, I mean, I just love the exciting, like not quite sure how a story will come about about your own family. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, th- I think that. And for She Always Wins, I mean, it's hard. You guys mentioned the souvenir 
earlier, it's hard not to bring that up, obviously on her. Um, but also it was definitely a reference. Um, and that kind of like subtle, hopefully nuanced and tense thing. I mean, I'd be honored to play anything anywhere near Joanna Hogg. So (laughs) (laughs) did y'all, did y'all get to see the eternal daughter? I did. I saw it at TIFF. Amazing. It's a, Danny and I were holding hands watching that movie. Yeah, it, was we very, it was a very, it was a spiritual experience. Um, thank you guys so much for coming on. It was on. a pleasure, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. This was fun. Up next from the icy regions of Colorado, a mother-daughter bonding story wrapped up in ecological activism and intergenerational angst. We're also here with uh, two filmmakers who made a very timely and exciting film, uh, Elegy for a Glacier, and they are... Stephanie Falkeis. (laughs) And uh, Nicholas Nyhoff. Stephanie and Nicholas, thanks so much for coming on. Great to have you both here. Um, Elegy for a Glacier, can you just tell us a little bit about the film and, and, and then you can drift into the inception of it, how the idea came and all that good stuff? Yeah. Where should we start? Nick, do you want to deliver the logline and I do the backstory? <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, um, Elegy for a Glacier is a story about uh, a young glaciologist who is called back to her hometown in order to uh, research and investigate the nearby glacier. Uh, the town wants to turn it into a, a, a tourist destination, um, build upon it. Mm. And uh, it's mm. ultimately about her and her mother. Um, they're estranged. And uh, it's mm. it's primarily about this eco-activist mother who's dri- driving the anti-development within the town. Yeah, so the two women sort of find themselves on opposite sides of a political and generational debate and and with the future of, of the town and also the future of their relationship hanging in the balance, yeah. sort of. Yeah. And in terms of the story's inception, um, it's interesting because um, I was really uh, inspired by an actual glacier that is disappearing uh, near my hometown in the Austrian Alps, where I was sort of found myself uh, trapped during the pandemic and um I hadn't been back there for almost a decade and I was really shocked to find that the glacier I had remembered from my childhood had almost completely disappeared sort of within a decade of what, what, you know, so I I could still remember how it looked like and it just created this really visceral feeling of melancholy and this pull. And then I found out that there was, um, you know, there there are always these sort of um, development ideas, you know, the land is protected, but then, you know, the towns are almost dying out and people are moving away. So there was this political tension already there. And I sort of uh, started developing the story from there and interviewing activists, scientists, local people, but also sort of, you know, really reading up on um, what is going on in terms of activism. And and I often wonder whether making this whole movie was really me trying to figure out why I'm not an activist, you know, it's almost like a, <laughs> I'm making a movie rather than doing something, which, you know, I'm still thinking about. You find yourself through your art and you Over. kind of discover your intention as you create, you know, I will shout until I know what I mean. Right off the bat, uh, this is the only one of these shorts that I've seen so far where I would have really loved to actually like see this in kind of a large format you know what i mean it's specifically bookending itself with some of the most beautiful like location photography i mean those the landscapes and the inside of the glacier at the very Mm -hmm. beginning and then like towards the very end it's shot nice and wide the color tone is like perfect for it yeah i'm just like looking at these shots i had to scrub through it again it really really is a beautiful beautiful short yeah We'll definitely pass that on to our DP who, you know, hiked up the mountain with like a huge Alexa on her back and lenses um, 11,000 feet above sea level. So the air was pretty thin. (laughs) Now, uh, we kind of spoil all of these shorts, unfortunately. It's kind of the nature of what we do here. So if you're listening, I highly recommend watching this before continuing uh, the episode. But I just have to ask, guys, (coughs) how did you get that last 
shot. It is, so, <laughs> it, is it is amazing. I mean, I mean, I don't Nothing want to spoil it for whoever's see. listening and they haven't watched it, but that last shot is incredible. So let's maybe Stephanie, let's talk about what the intention originally was yeah. for. Um, so, so we went out to the glacier and this is all shot on location out in Colorado, up in the mountains. And, um, you know, we got there and one, the glacier wasn't what we expected. And we can get into that a little bit later as well. But um, because the altitude's so high, uh, Stephanie had this had this idea for this drone shot the whole time. It was an early planning process. We had looked up, you know, we had to draw what we, we needed had to do. Team. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. And, uh, and when our drone op got up there and went to go fly it, we realized that the air was so thin that he was actually losing control of the wow. test flights. And so he, he kind of came to us and was like, Hey, listen, you know, I'm uncomfortable flying at this altitude. I don't think it's safe to put out actors underneath the drone at this point. Uh, we got to figure out something else. And so I'll let Stephanie tell you what we actually do. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So basically everything except the opening image where we're in the ice cave and some of the wide shots mm-hmm. is VFX, which is kind of sad because between the time that we went on location scout and then we went to shoot at the end of the summer, the glacier disappeared so much that the story stopped making sense. So the entire ICC is actually VFX. And there, and we had to sort of, you know, and this is really um, the behind the scenes stuff. We had to really think fast and um, we didn't end up shooting. We shot everything on the glacier. And then for the pullout shot, we had to basically shoot it next to the cabin and our team built a rig and we put up the camera and then we did the whole rotation in, also in post. So we, we at oh some point, God. we have to release wow. some sort of behind the scenes side by side yeah. because that entire idea of, of the pullout shot that I hope really brings emotionally together what the movie is about, uh, you know, was the magic of filmmaking. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm scrubbing through. Is, oh is that God. the only point where the glacier is kind yeah, of VFX? Uh, and there's is, also is, another wide shot um, a little okay. bit earlier. That's amazing, guys. Yeah, well, it was just so small that we started thinking, well, if we, you know, nobody would believe that people would put a ski, want to put a ski resort there because it's literally yeah. just rock, which, you know, was it was an interesting moment of art imitating life, imitating art, because by the time we got there, it was almost like too late <laughs> to tell the story. Stephanie, I, I had a question, like a shooting question for you. Um, did you guys shoot anamorphic? And if not, what did you guys shoot on? I, I think we, um, well, if I remember correctly, um, <laughs> we, we shot, uh, not on anamorphic lenses. We would have loved to, but there were budget limitations with, uh, shooting on such a remote spot. Um, but we shot in, it was really, the vision was sort of, um, a cinemascope vibe and we did yeah. a lot to achieve that in, sure. in color and also with framing and, and um, I talked a lot with our DP, um, Alexa Wolf, um, ahead of time because part of the inspiration for the vibe and the visual was really um, a Western in the sense mm. that, um, you know, the glacier is this last frontier that is trying yeah, yeah. to be tamed by man and therefore potentially ultimately destroyed. And, oh, this is so and you know, cool. the sort of the outsider coming in and the mother is kind of like the, the rebel or, you know, the vigilante activist um, battling yeah you right. know the the people coming to town and wanting to change yeah. everything well, so thinking, so a lot of that kind of came into the visuals um yeah, yeah. well now i'm kind of scrubbing through these landscapes i'm thinking of uh the good the bad and the ugly you know <laughs> it's definitely a compliment <laughs> this is like finding out uh how david fincher uses cg Dude. in his films yeah like and we're in ways you would never expect yeah, um, yeah. so really great work i uh Just wanted to say, you know, knowing, Stephanie, that this is tied into some of your own experiences, you know, in in your hometown and seeing nature change. I think being an urban kid Mm -hmm. living in the city, you know, oftentimes we talk about that in terms of gentrification, Mm -hmm. right? Like the environment changing around you, which is also reflective of how you're aging, (laughs) how Mm -hmm. the world is changing. Mm -hmm. But but specifically, when you look at like... uh, a landmark like that, a, a natural, um, uh, you know, icon, and 
especially as a kid, mm-hmm. being able to see a glacier or a mountain or volcano, like mm-hmm. in your, that must be so majestic, right? And as you get older and that thing fades, it's a literal, you know, we're all within the generation that started learning about global warming when we were in elementary school. So like to see that now in our, our mid to late twenties or thirties or however, Mm. I'm not assuming anything, but the point is to see (laughs) that in our, in our, you know, as we're getting older, that can be a very, um, I imagine, uh, startling and upsetting feeling. And I think, you know, for all the other like political aspects of the film, which are certainly there, I think that, using the vehicle of this relationship between mother and daughter to drive through the whole thing was very smart. I also appreciated that it was never outrightly stated. Um, it, you know, it was something that I, I figured was the case mm-hmm. and I was waiting even for the end for like her to say like mom in some way, but just leaving it as it is was good. Also, you know, we don't always address our parents as mom and dad, especially if we haven't seen them in several years and yeah. we're just, we're not intending to stick around. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I thought that was really well done as well. Yeah. Stephanie, you, you, you began the interview with saying, you know, uh, the movie in a lot of ways is you uncovering why you're not an activist and feeling bad about mm-hmm. it. Um, but I think <laughs> making activist film or films that have a, maybe a more left leaning point of view is, is actually, a, a, and Nick is gone. He'll be back. He's gone. Oh, right. okay. He's gone. Um, He's gone from here. The evil I, is gone. I think making. I think making film that may be a little bit more uh, leftist leaning is, is 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 it's difficult in its own right. And I was just wondering if you had any hesitation about making a film that was so overtly political, that was so overtly like we're losing the planet, and maybe we should just start damaging property. <laughs> right, right. I mean, there were. It's interesting you ask it because there were versions that were sort of you know I wrote probably you know, many, many drafts of the script and there were versions that leaned much more extreme. And then at some point it was like, wait, are we making a movie about eco-terrorism? Like it's, you're very fast (laughs) in those waters where it's like, it's not about what you're actually trying to say emotionally, you know? And I went down researching, I think even Colorado at some point in the eighties or nineties, um, there were people who blew something up and people died. And there's, there's a, a very, different version of a sort of eco thriller to be told there as well. But I think for me, um, I mean, I did have to promise, uh, promise some of my relatives in Austria that, you know, names won't be named, even though nobody ever blew something up. But um, yeah, it was an interesting line to, to sort of walk along. But I think for me, it was also important um, that, that it doesn't shy away from the politics of it because I think it, you know, people hopefully agree now that this isn't really something we can remove ourselves from. Yeah. Like you kind of mentioned that, I mean, I remember as a kid, this this um, glacier was like so omnipresent and, you know, the whole community because of also relies, like it's a whole ecosystem relying on it. And, and then coming back and having been away for so long, it's this kind of moment of realization that something that you thought was immortal isn't Mm. and it's a really it like really takes a while to take hold so i i hope it is political in the sense that it um it's very specific to the place but at the same time sort of a global issue you know and that that it's sort of in its specificity Mm. to that glacier it it sort of touches on on something bigger yeah i I don't know if that if that makes sense it does Um, definitely definitely yeah. yeah and i think what's what's great about like uh, talking about how things are like immortal it's like a lot of these the backgrounds in your movie it's like they're they're beautiful and they're majestic and it's like you know just nature which you know when you're you're in it like a lot of times it's just it can feel immortal because it's like yeah. it's been there for for so much longer than we've been here um and then the juxtaposition of like you know losing this this glacier and you know the just the idea of glaciers mm. you know in general like they're massive and like you know, they're fading. I, I think that's, you capture that really well in the movie. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and despite how little time we've been here relative to the rest of nature, how quickly and rapidly we've been affecting and yeah. destroying yeah. so much of it. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. very powerful yeah. uh, juxtaposition. Like we're going to see the disappearance in our own, all of our lifetime. Like it's not going to be, you know, you see photos of like a hundred years ago and then reconstructions yeah. of like yeah. what it looked like a thousand years ago. But it's really quite something to, to have that sort of struck you. Um, yeah, geez. 
all of our cast and crew, crew was from Colorado. And when they all went up to the glacier, everyone that we were working with was saying that this is the smallest they'd ever seen the glacier. And I think for a lot of them, it had been a long time since they'd been up there as well. So it was impacting them in that way too. Um, so it, it became personal in a lot of ways. All kind of nature and landscape photography kind of is inherently a time capsule and it just makes this film it's gonna it's gonna age really well mm-hmm. i think um well uh we at the media morgue uh what we do on our normal podcast is we take a new film and then we take an older more obscure film and we pair them together and see uh what comes nice. out of it uh, when you put two films together um, and we'd like to ask you, impromptu, uh, both Stephanie and Nick, what film, if your film was playing at like the Metrograph or at the Alamo, um, what film would you put Elegy for a Glacier with? Oh, wow. Should it be an old film or like a contemporary film? Yeah, or anything? Anything. Any film. Anything at all. Tricky. Any country, any medium. I almost think I would pair it with uh, the, it's a very recent film that's I think out right now, uh, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Yeah, I, I knew you were going to say it. Wow. I could feel it. Cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's going to be, uh, hopefully we'll have that on the show soon. I thought that was really I'm excited fun. about that one. It's playing just around the corner for me. It looks awesome. Um, Stephanie, you have one? Yeah, I'm just thinking of like, it would probably be cool to go with some really classical uh, Western movie, but then also that might might not work. Uh, it could work. It's just it too many work. movies. Why, why I'm not? like flipping through. Yeah, yeah, maybe even something like The Searchers, which is not a movie. Uh, oh, yeah, it's okay. very contemporary. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just thinking like right, Columbia right. Film School, and you know, yeah. going back like <laughs> half a decade, <laughs> and 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 uh, analyzing those scenes. Yeah, um, I could see the searchers. Yeah, it's about a family. It's a western about a family. Yeah, yeah, or maybe something really yeah. contradictory that would also be good. Maybe like the Natalie Wood of your movie is the environment, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Stephanie, Nick, thank you so much, uh, genuinely, for sharing this film with us. I think we all very much enjoyed it. Um, we are. Thank well, I'll say so personally much. that I will come and see it in the big theater so that I can I can get the full grasp of what you guys were doing there um yeah. and uh elegy for a glacier will be playing in program block g on sunday may 14th at 5 p.m it'll be ending out that block um which is very exciting i think it's a great way to end the block um and everybody hopefully everyone will be crying yeah well yeah everybody everybody <laughs> will be emotionally exhausted they'll have to sit next to their mother because it's mother's day um and it'll be great yeah all right thank you both so much coming along <laughs> thank you guys thank you so, thank much, you so much. much thanks for having us see you at the movies This has been another entry in our Columbia University Film Festival interview series. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoy what you heard. There will be more of these on our feed, so please check them all out and give these filmmakers the attention they deserve. Also, feel free to peruse our mainline episodes. There's always something to see inside the morgue. Leave a rate and review wherever you get the show. We greatly appreciate it. Till next time.